Welcome to the DK Kim Foundation lecture series offered by the Center for Asian Business at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. This program is funded by a grant from the DK Kim Foundation in Ontario, California. Good evening, everyone, and thanks uh, for being here. Thanks for showing your interest, love, and support for Korea. Um, it's a really important country that I, in my humble opinion, doesn't always get the attention it deserves, so thank you. I also just want to thank all the, the dignitaries here, Consul General Deans. Um, I'm going to take a photograph and show it to my mom to prove that I've <laughs> been something. But um, anyway, and finally, on baseball, um, let me just say, um, Yes, I'm a huge uh, Doosan Bears fan in Korea, for people who know that. And probably the best title I've ever had in my life that wasn't mentioned in my bio is I am the honorary commissioner, ambassador, honorary ambassador of the Korean Baseball League, which basically means, according to my mother, showing up at a lot of baseball games, eating a lot of chicken, and imbibing in um, adult beverages from time to time. So anyway, so it's a Jesuit institution. So um, let, me just, uh, let me just say... Um, it's always hard to talk about Korea because there are some people who know very little, like myself when I started uh, out uh, learning about Korea, and then there are some who know everything about Korea and tell me if Kim Jong-un has a ham sandwich before noon, that means he's going to do a nuclear test, right? So you're always trying to find the right level of the audience. So what I was going to try to do is go for about 20 to 40 minutes, somewhere in that neighborhood, and then get to questions, because I think the questions are inherently more interesting than hearing myself talk. But to say, so for the goal here, I've got some slides. And basically, what I'm going to try to do is do kind of three things um, that will probably hopefully inform you for the news of the day on these potential talks between uh, North Korea and the United States. First is just to go over a little bit of the history. Um, it's a sort of a, a history that is not well known but it's incredibly important today. Um, second, talk a little bit about the current situation in South Korea and North Korea, kind of current politics, economics, that often get glazed over, that are also important factors. They often get glazed over, and everybody wants to go right to this kind of cage match between Kim Jong-un and President Trump and ignore all the external contributing factors. So a little bit on that. And then finally, we'll get to the current negotiations, and then... Uh, fire away with questions. So let me just dive right in. And if I start to fall behind time, I'm probably just going to speed up and uh, go forward from there. So first, um, let me, on the history, let's just look, um, before we get right into the history, what I want to do is just say, let's do the neighborhood quickly, because it's incredibly important, and it will run through every part of current negotiations, South Korean politics, North Korean politics. This is, I would argue, the most important neighborhood in the world. Uh, and look at, just look at the, the facts here. Two declared nuclear weapon states in close proximity, right? Um, Russia, China, the U.S., which by treaty alliances is drawn in. Uh, North Korea's program, obviously. Japan and Korea have basically a, the ability to break out if they want, and so does Taiwan, just a little further uh, down south. It's a business school, so this is you know, the flight deck of the world's economy. World's, if you count the U.S., number one. Number two number three or four economies, plus Korea is about 10 to 12, depending on which indicator you use. So you get disruption here, the global economy goes south. It also sits on the fault line between free market democracy and whatever system you want to call North Korea, China, Russia, but it's a clear fault line. Uh, and important, important in that regard as well. Um, for the U.S., two of our five treaty allies that we are bound to defend in time of war are right in this neighborhood. If you go a little further south, you've got the Philippines, which is also a treaty ally, and Taiwan, which is governed by a strange act called the Taiwan Relations Act. Important, but nebulous. That's why I say strange. Our bilateral relationships, two of our most difficult, important relationships, Beijing and Moscow, sit in this region. 80 to 90,000 troops, the only the only forward deployed aircraft carrier in the world sits in Japan, but has responsibilities in Korea as well. There's no NATO collective self-defense uh, like we see in Europe. And on top of all this, deep, unresolved historic and territorial issues that date back to World War II or even further. So just when you think the stakes are high with North Korea and the United States, 
look at the neighborhoods. The stakes are even higher. Okay, um, quickly, I'm not going to go through all of this, but let's just on a little bit of a recent history on the Korean uh, on on Korea itself. I'm going to pick this up 1897-ish, uh, late 1890s. Basically, what you have, and, and forgive me, I'm going to oversimplify and glaze over. And you know, there are you know semester-long courses on the ten-year blocks of this, so this is going to get oversimplified. But just a, a basic understanding. Korea basically is the, the the chosen dynasty is falling apart, and more or less you you have this what's called the empire the empire of Korea, which didn't really have extra any extra territories, but continued the dynasty into the into the twentieth century. But at that time, there are three foreign powers that are looming large in Korea: China, Russia, and Japan. And through a series of conflicts, Japan emerges triumphant, and then we go right into the next phase in 1910, formal annexation and colonization, occupation, whatever you want to call it, by Japan, which lives, looms large in current Korean politics, looms large in North Korea, and is a huge issue uh, to this day. The Japanese are there. It's a really uh, brutal uh, colonization, occupation, again, whatever you want to call it. Um, and that only ends with the end of World War II. Uh, World War II ends, and basically the United States proposes a division of the, the peninsula, and there's a lot of myth, but also a lot of uh, machinate, political machination about how that occurred. But basically it comes down to the U.S. really being interested centrally in Japan, not wanting the Soviets to, over, uh, to control the peninsula. They propose a division along the 38th parallel. To their surprise, the United States surprise, the Soviets go for it. That's how you start with division. But in theory, you were supposed to have democratic elections and the peninsula would reunify. Never happens, obviously. Um, you have the, the Korean War, which is well documented. Uh, but the basic thrust of the Korean War, the North attacks, almost pushes the South Korean and US forces completely off the peninsula. This little corner here, this little map you'll see up there, this little corner barely holds up uh, uh, the perimeter, it's called the Pusan perimeter, holds up enough to get reinforcements in from Japan, from the United States, and the U.S. basically pushes back to the, all the way up to the Yalu River. A few forces make it all the way to the Yalu. Most didn't get that far. The Chinese intervene, and basically after a really long, terrible uh, conflict that involved a lot of uh, U.S. air power, a lot of destruction, the, the, the war basically ends where it started, almost along the 30, uh, 38th parallel, what's called the demilitarized zone today. That also has implications today. The UN, obviously the US did not fight under its own flag, it fought under the UN flag. So at, at, the, at the dividing line today, it's actually United Nations Command which sits there at that, at that division, that's important too. Um, fast forward, 1953, end of the Korean War. South Korea uh, is devastated. It doesn't have the industrial um, infrastructure that the North has. It's highly agrarian. And through a combination of really smart policy by the South Koreans, uh, in, at times ignoring the US's advice, uh, gradually, and this really accelerates in the 1970s, uh, basically the most spectacular growth of democracy and free markets in the history of the world. Uh, how did that happen? Then there's a picture here of a very controversial leader today, Pak Chung-hee. Um, basically, you have a series of wobbly um, democracies and autocrats, and eventually Pak Chung-hee seizes power uh, in the 60s, uh, and this runs its course. He's assassinated in the late 70s, runs its course. The, the dictatorship effectively ends in right, right around the time of the Koreans hosting the, the Summer Olympics in 1988. So young democracy in the South. In the North, early on, industrial output is high. It looks like the North Korean system is somehow more effective, um, but that basically collapses uh, under its own weight. Uh, the Soviet subsidies dry up. Long story short, divided, two different systems. We'll go, get into a little bit more of that uh, later. 1990s roll around, end of the Cold War. North Korea is basically isolated by itself, starts its own nuclear program, which is well documented. The South Korean economy continues to take off with some bumps over the Asian financial crisis, but basically becomes a global, global power uh, that we know today. All right, next slide. Here's the contrast of the, the current results. I mean, it sort of uh, speaks volumes. Uh, look at Seoul, I mean, it's amazing. About 20 to 25 million people live there today. The other place, Pusan, if you count the 
big neighborhood, five to seven million, but unbelievable dynamic uh, country. Today, um, you know, the, 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 the nickname for Korea among many is the land of the morning calm. That's totally false. It's actually called the land of morning surprise uh, because every day you pick up the newspaper and there's something crazy happening in Korean politics, economics, uh, the demilitarized zone, uh, but it's a still, I, it pretends to be calm. I don't know. I don't know how they got that name, but anyway. Um, the system today is unicameral. There's one National Assembly, a very strong president, one five-year fixed term. There's talk of constitutional reform in South Korea, but the president has a lot of power in South Korea. Um, I mentioned the rapid economic growth, but there is an economic slowdown, um, and that is disproportionately hurting uh, young people here today. Uh, youth unemployment has risen to double digits and probably is higher, or not just, you know, it's probably 15% uh, officially, it's about 10 to 12. Unofficially, higher because a lot of young people stay in school, take one class because it's easier to find a job as a student, not unemployed. And that's, a, that's a developing and serious problem, probably due to structural issues in the economy. Um, you also, at the same time, you have a very, um, you have an aging population, and Koreans have one of the lowest birth rates in the world. So you have this really as, as successful as the South Korean model has been, you've got, now you've got basically rich world problems, rich, 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 rich country problems. Aging population, structural economic issues, young people that are, are probably underemployed and probably the most educated young population in the world. Um, you, have, you still have mandatory conscription in the South, big military, about two years, a little less. Every government comes in and chips away, makes that smaller and smaller, but still, mandatory conscription. And if you don't serve, you basically better have a good reason, medical exemption, or you renounce your citizenship. I mean, it is, Koreans treat this very seriously. And in fact, you know, there have been prime ministers, presidents rocked by scandals of their children not serving. Um, U.S. Treaty ally I mentioned, there's about 30,000 troops in Korea right now. The, um, this presence used to be controversial in the 80s. It was incredibly important all the way up to the 80s. In the 80s, during the democracy movement, it became somewhat controversial. I would argue the relationship has basically matured today, and it's popular. Uh, there's kind of a myth that the U.S. troop presence there is not popular. It's actually polls very high, 70 to 90 percent uh, at times. Okay. Recent politics, uh, I picked this up in 12. You could go back a little further. But basically, you have 10 years of conservative rule, um, and you have a lot of tension with DPRK, the North Korea, at this time. You have very complex relations with Japan and uh, People's Republic of China. We can get more into that later. Um, but I think under the conservative government, you could sort of argue even the liberal government that preceded it you see a maturing of the U.S. ROK alliance along that arc. In 1617, you have a massive um, scandal. And basically what happens is, remember Pak Chung-hee, the dictator that I showed there? His daughter gets elected uh, to, the, um, to, to the presidency. She had run before. She uh, made a successful run in 2012. And she is hit by a massive, I guess you'd sort of say influence peddling scandal, for lack of a better term. And her support overnight collapses. She's impeached, removed from office, currently in jail, um, in a stunning turn of events, uh, underscored by a what was called candlelight diplomacy, massive, massive demonstrations in the square of Seoul, Guanghaman Square is what it's called, that you know made sure uh, to let uh, both the National Assembly and the Supreme Court, which ultimately votes on whether or not she stays in office, that people wanted her out. It was stunning. Moon Jae-in, a human rights lawyer from Pusan, who had run unsuccessfully against Park Geun-hye, and two years into Park Geun-hye's term, was left for dead politically, was out in the wilderness, really mar a, mounts a remarkable comeback. And the left in Korea returns to power after about a decade of absence. Um, we have, and we'll get into this a little bit more, the inter-Korean peace process is revved up. That was essentially dormant uh, during the tenure of conservative rule, though some nibbles here and there. Um, the economy, as I mentioned, is becoming a major issue, a uh, domestic issue for Moon Jae-in. And uh, the regional relationships have gotten, I would say, uneven. You have a lot of tensions with Japan, uh, I would say suspicions with China, and we'll get into the alliance dynamics, which are complicated as well between the U.S. and I, I'll keep going. So 
You see President Moon's approval rating. It's dropping over time. These are, this slide's a little old. It's uh, from, um, I think, November, December timeframe. But he was sky high after some of the summitry between him and Kim Jong-un. And it's basically dropping down to the high 40s, low 50s. And a lot of the reason, next slide, is it's the economy. I won't belabor this slide, but it's just kind of a tracker related to people's confidence in getting a job versus Moon Jae-in's approval rating, and they're linked. Employment's becoming a major issue in Korea. Um, the conservatives, this is the other point of current Korean politics, have almost completely collapsed as a party. So you have the liberals in power and the conservatives in complete disarray. That is starting to slowly change. The conservatives are starting to get organized. Uh, the, the, the woman here in the middle, Nak Kyung Wan, was just elected as their floor leader in the National Assembly, first woman floor leader. Um, there's been party leaders that have been women. And um, so they seem to be, and she doesn't have, there's a lot of baggage between pro-President Park, anti-President, she doesn't have a lot of that, that, that baggage. So she may, may be able to sort of broker um, some unity within the party. And basically, in Korean elections for the National Assembly, the most important thing is unity. So if, there, if there's unity, your party generally wins. The conservatives were on a, ver a couple of years ago were on the verge of a supermajority in the National Assembly. They could not get unified. They collapsed and were punished at the polls. So this is something to watch. And as the economy goes, and as the conservatives get more organized, it will be interesting to see how that impacts North Korea policy for Moon Jae-in. All right, next slide. North Korea, the, the, our friends up north. Um, we have a dynasty. We have three generations of Kims, uh, punctuated in Kim Jong-un. And as I mentioned, um, you know, we can go through, there's a long history about how the Kims get into power, but more or less people argue that the Soviet Union installs him and helps uh, him get rid of a lot of his competition, more or less. Right? That's a gross oversimplification, but there's a, lot, there's a f huge founding myth about him fighting in, uh, and what he's done. Demystified most historians, a lot of Soviet help getting into power. His son, um, Kim, uh, Kim Il-sung, the, the, the first ruler, obviously, his son, Kim Jong-il, and now Kim Jong-un, who's very young when he comes to power. Um, Mentioned the nuclear weapons programs. Dates to the 90s, some people argue the 80s. There's some chalkboard R&D going on. But you have, I think this is six nuclear tests, that's right, and a lot of missile tests. So essentially what has happened is the program started off as a very small, a nascent, probably a lender of last resort program, and today has become a really big program, and I'll get into that uh, later. I mentioned some of the things that were, were attempted. In the 90s, you'll hear this thing called the Agreed Framework. It was a Clinton administration attempt to, to hem in the program, and it basically said, give up your nuclear program, and we'll give you some light water reactors for energy, give you some oil, and diplomatic recognition. The deal, for a number of reasons, collapsed. The Bush administration then tried what was called the... To, they, they, basically, they, they went through kind of this period of... Um, ignoring the North, labeling them the axis of evil, and then more or less coming up with a pretty good agreement called the 2005 Joint Statement, which looked a lot like the agreed framework, uh, but that too collapsed under um, a, a complicated issue re related to Treasury sanctions, Department of Treasury sanctions. The North, um, big conventional army, most men are subjected to eight to 10 year uh, conscription. I think it's 10 still, and it's a long time. Um, the army is big but decaying. No money has been put into it. But asymmetric threats are on the rise. Cyber attacks, Sony Pictures, remember that? That's, that there's a lot of investment in that. Nuclear weapons, submarines, things like that. They're spending their money on asymmetric threats that bother uh, the, the South Koreans and the US. Worst human rights record in the world, I would argue, that was uh, put forward, uh, really established by what was called the Kirby Commission a few years back, an Australian jurist charged by the UN to document the human rights concerns, and serious gulag style, terrible. We can talk more about that later. But what I think what's interesting here in this final point that I wanted to get to is that as hermetically sealed as North Korea seems, it's called the Hermit Kingdom, you know, it's kind of a closest thing to a totalitarian regime, all of that. Um, there's no doubt states are, that information is seeping into the state. 
and um, market activity is on the rise over the last 20 years. And that market activity, it's a great book called North Korea Confidential by two British journalists, basically undermining the state's control. Um, it's basically the state is no longer the, the guarantor of economic security that like it was. Markets are empowering women in strange ways, undermining the state, encouraging corruption. So the market activity is something internally that the North Korean regime has had to face uh, themselves and is a really important factor. All right, so recent politics in North Korea, and he does have politics. Um, but you know, there was a question early on is whether this 30-plus-year-old was in control or was somebody else running the show. My view, and people can debate this endlessly, I, I think he's in control. Um, he clearly purged the opposition, including some famous executions involving his uncle, his brother, uh, things like that. Um, the, Kim, the Kim family name still holds cachet among the elites. And, you know, the elites don't have a lot of choices in North Korea. You know, the, the oversimplified statement is you either, either hang together or you hang separately. Um, and I think there's not a lot of uh, wiggle room here. So he's in control. He's not like his father. Um, he's been much more black and white in terms of willing, willing to be aggressive, uh, willing to basically put um, strong rhetoric out. His father was more of uh, someone who played a little bit more on the diplomatic stage, although he's starting to do that. But early on, much more black and white. It's unclear how sophisticated his strategy is. Um, you can argue early on he missed opportunities. Um, you know, you can argue that he probably should have gone to Moscow in 2015. He was invited by uh, Vladimir Putin. That summit got canceled, alienated the Russians. He has some opportunities uh, with Prime Minister Abe in Japan over an issue called abductees. That, too, uh, fell flat. Uh, he walked out of inter-Korean talks with the conservative government in 2015, um, didn't take Barack Obama up on endless opportunities to engage the U.S. Uh, so I always feel that he could have divided this coalition that was aligned against him and kept the nuclear missile programs churning away. Didn't do that. Um, now, was that because he just said, I'm going to run a darn the torpedoes um, strategy and just absorb pain, build up my program, and then trade trade pieces away? Or was it because he missed opportunities? Not sure. And then I just say the other bullet here is all this recent diplomacy, this is not new for North Korea. They have run a very traditional play here. This looks a lot very familiar from the 90s, very familiar under the Bush administration, familiar under early Obama days. What's different is the U.S. president, right? His reaction. So I think the jury is still out on whether or not Kim Jong-un really wants to change, how sophisticated of an operator he is, and how different he'll be from traditional North Korean diplomacy. Last point on this, this is the, the this is, you know, my own theory is he's built an, he's got an interesting model, right? He's, but he can't sustain this for a long time. I mentioned the markets. He's got markets working with him. He cannot have terrible relations like he did for the first part of his tenure with the Chinese. You just cannot have, the, the North Koreans depend too much on the Chinese. You cannot have that. You can't have nothing going on with the Japanese and South Koreans and the United States. You've got to get something going. So I think part of what's interesting here is to see whether or not he is actually trying to change his model, as I mentioned earlier. Second thing is he's got all this sanctions pressure. There's no doubt that the sanctions have worked, in my view. In other words, like they're not perfect. They take time, but the last round of multilateral sanctions have been crushing, and it's applying sanctions pressure on a pretty sick economy to begin with. So he's got to make, I think, some kind of move here. You know, you can build a model, you can kill all of your elites, you can try to come to power, you can alienate the Chinese, all of that, you can absorb sanctions pressure for so long, but eventually you're going to have to make a move, right? It's like taking your car and driving it 200 miles an hour, right? You can do it for a little while if you have the right car, but eventually the car is going to blow up. You're going to get into an accident unless you slow down and make some changes. So that's, that's where we are with North Korea, at least in my humble opinion. And I'm sure if you got 10 North Korean experts up here, we disagree on 35 issues. So anyway, uh, all right, so this is on the economy. I'll skip this, but look, negative growth rates. And then, the, then open question. There have been these little nibbles of you know, free market zones. Should we do this in North Korea? All of that. 
you know, nibbling at uh, uh, free market or, or trying to come to grips with these markets and, and growth in his, in, in his country that they know exist, they know they have to let, um, they, they know they have to let lie because they're, they're basically uh, critical for providing basic um, uh, economic security for North Koreans, but they, are, they feel stuck. So some people argue that he's looking at different models. You've got the Singapore model, right? Authoritarian strongman, city-state, just visited there. You've got the China model, Deng Xiaoping, all that stuff. Um, and I, I tend to think like the one that looks probably the closest is Vietnam, that if he were to make a move, it'd probably look the closest, but more on that later. Okay, getting into the negotiations, and uh, this is always a fun topic, so, because it, everybody, you get to speculate all over the map. Um, first, I just should, should mention, you know, you always get the question, why is he going into negotiations? Why, uh, you know, my, my sense is, you know, Let's put it this way. He, there was no interest from the North Koreans in the Obama administration to negotiate. So why the sudden shift? Right? That's, that's an open question. People, I think, mistakenly say Obama didn't want to talk, strategic patience, all that. It's, that's not true. Um, there were multiple entreaties to the North Koreans at the UN. People also forget early in the Obama administration, there was actually a deal with the North Koreans called the Leap Day Deal. So... There was a lot of activity under the Obama administration, but the North Koreans were not um, interested in talking. And as the South Korean foreign minister always used to say, it takes two to tango, which I always wondered how we got to that. But anyway, um, so let's just quickly, a couple reasons why his consolidation of power may be over, right? Um, he likes the geopolitical terrain a little better, right? Left, left-wing government in South Korea. Republicans in power in the uh, U.S., that's when the last time they effectuated a, more of a rapprochement or at least um, coming out of their diplomatic shell. The sanctions are working. That's another possible reason, I've argued. They're, they're pretty isolated for a while, right? They had no friends in the world, and their diplomatic space was definitely closing down. They were getting kicked out of countries, diplomatic facilities shut down, so the isolation, and that caused some trepidation in North Korea. Uh, also, some internal forces at work, right? You had the markets probably some internal politics saying, hey, is this guy 32 years old? Pretty reckless behavior, probably some internal pressure. And then the size of the program, uh, nuclear missile programs, right? That, that the programs had gotten so big, right? And they had basically developed their missiles to such a point that there was an open question whether or not they have an ICBM capability. So basically they have a big program with a lot of weapons, which is, oh, by the way, still growing. Um, and they have tested enough on their missile technology where they feel confident that in their miss ability to deliver uh, nuclear payloads, but have stopped short from tests that would indicate certainty of an ICBM, which might bring about a huge reaction from the U.S. So the positioning of their program got to a point, and so he declared success. He's a nuclear power. He's enshrined it in his constitution. Time to negotiate, right? Maybe, all right? So those are some of the, the theories that are out there, and they could be a multivariate equation as well. All right, so really you have two processes going. This is an oversimplification in the current negotiations. There's denuclearization, which I've talked a lot about, which is, I'd say, more of an international uh, uh, process these days. Um, and the reason is, is because since the early 2000s or late 90s, more and more multilateral sanctions have layered on and more and more diplomatic energy across the globe has been concerned about this. And one of the things that drives the concern is if you let the North Korean program um, basically exist as it is or grow, it unravels the nuclear nonproliferation regime around, around the world. So more international attention, but generally driven by the U.S. On the other, on the, and this is what gets all the attention in the media. On the other side, you have uh, the inter-Korean peace process, which gets very little attention in the U.S., but is incredibly important and not well understood. So I'm going to go through this quickly and then get to questions. But basically, um, I talked about the, uh, the Clinton administration attempts, which I actually think were the closest we ever got. Um, and pretty comprehensive deal, um, pretty, pretty darn close. And even Secretary Powell, when he was Secretary of State, supported the Clinton-era deal. We can talk through the mechanics of that, but that was pretty close. Um, talked about the Bush administration who tore down the deal and then kind of resurrected it, um, but did stand up the six-party talks, which still 
I guess technically exist today, but haven't, I don't think the six party talks have met in over a decade. Um, Obama, I mentioned, a deal early in his tenure, the Leap Day deal, and then the so-called strategic patience, which never was our policy, but people like to say it because Hillary Clinton said it a couple of times and she ran for president. So, um, but the, the, the bottom line here is, as I mentioned, the program is big, it's capable, the open source, we'll talk about 20 plus weapons are possible, ICBM capable, I mentioned, the unilateral, the, the, the Security Council at the UN and a multitude of unilateral sanctions are in effect on the North Koreans. And then the Trump administration policy of maximum pressure, right? A lot of pressure at the North Koreans militarily and sanctions, which then quickly pivoted to uh, direct bilateral talks between the leaders. The, I mentioned this earlier, but the role of China is critical. They are the economic lifeline to the North Koreans after the Soviet Union collapsed. The region's also important. The Japanese, the South Koreans, as I is on the nuclear question, is important. Quickly on process two, and then I want to try to quickly get through the rest of these slides and wrap up. Um, the inter-Korean process used to be all about economic, cultural exchanges, family reunions, which are so important to the North Koreans. Moon Jae-in has linked the two processes, right? Said that the denuclearization is part of the inter-Korean process. Um, and What's interesting here is that the two sometimes rub up against each other. Um, I'll get to that in just a second, but at the end of the day, there is a stream of thought within Korean foreign policy, or not even foreign policy, I say political life in South Korea, that says, hey, the foreign powers need to get out. They have messed up the peninsula enough. We need to solve this, and we need to be in the driver's seat to solve that. So that's a lot what drives the ideology behind the inter-Korean process. The problem is, Generally, the North Koreans want to talk to the U.S., and generally, you need the foreign powers to deal with the nuclear weapons because the South Koreans probably don't have enough leverage to try to get that done. Having said that, they've tried. They've tried basically a, what's called the sunshine policy, simple engagement, um, to try to open this up. But at the end, you probably need some combination of the two. Um, quickly, we can I'll, I'll glaze through the rest, but... Um, you know, there have been five inter-Korean summits. These are just important. The first one was probably the most famous between Kim Dae-jung and, 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 uh, and <coughs> Kim Jong-il. And the 2007 one was largely ineffectual because late in the South Korean presidency's term. But what's different here is the inter-Korean summits that are happening today are early in Moon Jae-in's term. And that's important because it gives the South Korean president more runway and more maneuverability. Having said that, at the end here, let me just um, get off this slide by saying... If you talk to the South Korean government today, they'll tell you that their ability to move forward on inter Korean progress is hampered by sanctions, and they need some kind of sanctions relief, and that's important. That's an important, and how the South Koreans, the United States, and the rest of the international community sort out the sanctions question is part of the negotiations. All right, I'm going to glaze through these, but let's just go to quickly on the talks of the uh, the, the, the talks of the century in Singapore, and then we'll get to the last slide. Um, essentially, the outcomes was what was called the Singapore Declaration, which was basically a, a vague document, had four points to it. I won't go through all the points, but basically the, the crux of it was we're going to get along better between the U.S. and North Korea, and we want to make more progress, right? That's a gross oversimplification, but that's basically it. The U.S. suspended its military exercises, which has been a long-standing complaint of the North Koreans and the Chinese. Uh, and the North Koreans basically subsequently said they weren't going to test. They're going to allow some sort of inspections into their big nuclear facility at Yongbyon and more or less dismantle their ICBM test site. Um, it let the North Koreans have a little more diplomatic freedom of action. They're definitely more active on the international stage, both in the immediate run-up and in the aftermath of the summit. And the US probably lost a little leverage. They, they put the president out there, and the North Koreans really want to meet with the president. And a lot of people argue they lost a little bit of leverage in that process. We'll see. Um, omissions, things that weren't agreed to or weren't, um, there was not what was called the, the previous talks, the 2005 joint statement, for example, the six party talks. Those weren't the basis for negotiations going forward. There wasn't really discernible progress on denuclearization. Wasn't many specifics out of this, and there weren't a lot of concessions by the DPRK. But on the other hand, the U.S. didn't give on sanctions relief either. So that's important too. All right, so 
I'm going to keep going through all this because I'm going to get to questions here. A lot about inter-Korean and all that. So let's just, let's just end on, actually I have two last slides. Let's look at some of the issues to watch, right? If you're going to keep score at home, right? Let's, where, where does this summit, if it happens, come out on denuclearization? Do we get a freeze on the North Korean program? Do we get a declaration? The North Koreans declare their program? Doubtful, the US seems to be softening on that position. Do we get a rollback of the program? Do we get inspections? And do we get a definition of what denuclearization is to both sides, right? That's esoteric but important. Um, is there sanctions relief proffered, both either changes at the Security Council? Are there bigger humanitarian exemptions? The US has already done some. And will there be carve-outs for specific inter-Korean uh, projects? Also, will there be an end of war declaration? Technically, the US is still at war with North Korea. Will there be some sort of end of war declaration? Will there be liaison offices? Will the US set up a mini embassy in Pyongyang? And what, there's been a lot of talk about the out, will US troop presence or more exercises be on the table? State Department emphatically says they will not be. However, last time the president made a unilateral split second on the spot decision on exercises. Other issues to watch, the missile program, the mini talk of that, will there be a freeze, rollback inspections? Secondary issues they probably won't get to, but are important to know. Chemical and biological programs in North Korea, big and scary. Uh, human rights issues. And the fate of United Nations Command, which governs the demilitarized zone between the two Koreas. And then, obviously, the follow-on step. So keeping score at home, watch those items. That will be important. All right, last slide. Um, this is my oversimplified um, possible outcomes. Outcome one, big success the North Koreans give on denuclearization. Probably unlikely, but hey, you are then a lot of momentum, right? You can go for sanctions relief. You can start the diplomatic process. Catastrophic failure. Nothing happens. The leaders get mad at each other. There's recriminations. That's very bad. And we're going to fall back probably into, the U.S. will probably fall back into a, a pressure campaign of sorts. Or a mushy middle, right? A, some sort of small concessions on each side, right? And then the question is how big are those concessions and where do we go from here and what's the follow-up? And the mushy middle is where we've tended to end up in the past. All right, so conclusions. Uh, as I mentioned before, history plays a big role. Huge historical pressures. The two processes, denuclearization, inter-Korean talk, are linked and there's some friction. Not much out of the first summit. Uh, we'll see if there's a second summit what happens there. And this next summit, really important, really important. Um, and I would argue, I think the US leverage is not great. We're not in the best position we could be in um, for a number of reasons, and it, that gives me a little concern. But um, sometimes that's why you have meetings between two leaders, right? You get them in a room, you just never know what happens. And on that, let me end and perhaps take questions. Thanks. I mean, my first thing would be to try, and I think they're doing this already, um, the South Korea-U.S. alliance has been kind of up and down recently. And it, you saw the um, issues over burden sharing for U.S. troops. Basically, we're, we're in this dispute over who pays how much for U.S. troops to be there. We go through this every five years. It's a terrible negotiation. Um, nobody likes it, um, but at the end, we get to an agreement and everybody goes out and has a big dinner and then years later we talk about how horrible the negotiation was and we're all friends, right? And that's what the crux of the alliance is about. That process broke down this time and basically they were only able to get a one year extension, it sounds like, maybe. And I think getting those alliance issues right is the most important thing, right? And part of it is the US didn't have an ambassador for almost two years. We still don't have an assistant secretary of state that would preside over this. I think, thank goodness, Steve Began is there because I think he's done a lot of work. He's the special envoy. But I think getting those alliance issues, just get those buttoned down. Because you're just not going to make progress on North Korea unless you're tight with the South Koreans. The North will sense it. They know it. They read the South Korean newspapers. And they'll exploit that split. And if you don't have that foundation right, you can't really build the rest of the house. So that would be sort of job one. I think job two would be then figure out 
the South Korean-Japan relationship, right, a little bit more. I'm not saying condition the whole thing on it, but try to get that in a better spot because what that does, when you have the South Koreans and the Japanese getting along better, it puts more pressure on Beijing to in turn put more pressure on North Korea. So I'd get, kind of get the, the fundamentals right on that first. Second thing I would do, I would continue to keep the pressure on because to me, look, I'm, I'm an Obama loyalist and Obama, Cuba, Iran, Burma, Vietnam, all of that through engagement. But what we found with the North Koreans just like the Iranians, leverage matters, right? The Iranian example, everybody says it's this, you know, we did all this diplomacy, absolutely. But people talk less about the fact we kept two aircraft carriers in the Persian Gulf almost at all time. And when one aircraft carrier left, we put fighters in the Arab states to keep the pressure on the Iranians. The Israelis also put some pressure on them too. But that led to the ability to to uh, get to the table. So I would keep looking for more leverage, and I think there are some more leverage points out there. And that comes back to South Korea, Japan. If you're not unified on that, your leverage is gone. And then the last thing I would say is I would probably try to get, figure out, I mean, you're in this complicated dance with the Chinese on trade, right? And how does that relate with the North Korean? I, I just would try to assess that out a little more. Um, and make sure, because, look, you get basically your two allies in place, you work for leverage, and then you bring all that to the Chinese and try to create a very unified front. The Russians I, are, are difficult because they will play spoiler, but generally if you have the Chinese, Japanese, South Koreans, there's not a whole lot the Russians can do other than to kind of mess around at the Security Council. So that would be my big advice. And then you get into all the tactics, which, you know, like, you know, what sites, inspections. I do think a declaration is important of the whole facility, you know, the whole thing. That's where the negotiations got hung up about a decade ago. It's important to get that declaration because if you don't have the declaration, you know, you're just kind of guessing what the North Koreans will tell you they have. Let's put it that way. So I think a declaration is really important. And how you stage that, it, to me, is probably the most important thing in these negotiations. Too early, the talks collapse. Too late, it's not serious. So how you sequence that's important. I can give you more, but that's kind of an all-day seminar. Uh, anyway, so, all right. Hope that answered the question. All right, let's go to the back there. My role at Boeing, um, I do kind of international relations at Boeing. And, you know, because this is a business school, Boeing does outreach uh, at campuses. So we, we're always, uh, Boeing's always on the lookout for, for new and emerging talent. In fact, our CEO says the, probably the most important thing is attracting talent because there is a global competition for talent. And so, um, you know, I, do, I deal with a lot of uh, foreign governments at Boeing. How does it relate to Korea specifically? Um, I, I don't do diplomacy anymore. Uh, that's... You know, I do that sort of as, I guess, an alumni function. Um, but, uh, but, but I do do a lot of commercial diplomacy now at Boeing. So the skill set translates pretty well. And in fact, we have a former British ambassador, two US ambassadors, a former Israeli ambassador on Boeing's um, international team to help adjudicate um, international commercial issues for the, the, the Boeing company. There's a whole, look, there's a lot of Koreans here who probably answer this question better than me, but um, what, what a lot of Western companies tell me, it's interesting that the human capital in Korea is amazing, right? It is best educated, hardest working, you know, you just go down the line, right? Uh, uh, I was at this agricultural show once in Korea, and uh, I was talking to all these American um, comp small companies like brewers and, you know, Apple guy, you know, like this, and they were all talking about, um, it, it was interesting, they were having great success in Korea, and I had one guy, he said, he said, I said, well, how are you doing? He goes, well, it's a gangbusters, we're doing all this work, and I said, well, how many employees do you have? He's like, two. I said, what? He said, well, you know, hire a Korean, hire an army, you know, I mean, it's, it's so, that, that gives you a sense of the human capital you're dealing with in Korea. I think what is really interesting is that Korean companies, and it, that it's getting better and changing, there's a lot of um, time spent sitting around at offices waiting for your boss to leave because the old days in Korea, 
the boss had to leave, before those bosses left, before those bosses left, before those bosses left. So if Western companies tell me, and a big insurance company told me, they said, we've imp implemented Western style rules here, where, where everybody le comes in at 8.30, they leave at six, we don't go out for these work dinners, which I think are, the work dinners are an interesting part of Korean culture in that they, you do a lot of bonding, uh, but you stay out late. Right, and it disproportionately disadvantages women who are then the caregivers. So there's a whole issue there, but they basically said, look, we'll, we'll do a dinner once a week or twice a week. Productivity goes like this, right? So it's really interesting. Um, and I think Korean companies are starting to figure this out, right? Some companies, a, a big bank told me they actually turn off their computers at seven o'clock now to make people leave. Um, you know, so there, and you know, they, it's, it's, and they've cut down on the amount of, nighttime activities. So I, I think there are a lot of management, uh, there are a lot of uh, management practices that are applicable to Korea that translate well. And I think you look at some of the best um, outcomes in Korea commercially, it's when you kind of have the fusion of the two, right? It gets really interesting fast. The only other thing I'd say is, I think the Koreans, and they know this and they're working hard on this, is the role of women. And you know what, what happens is, and there was a great piece um, in the New York Times about this over the weekend in Japan, but it's not dissimilar, um, is that you know, women are generally expected to be the caregivers. Um, it disadvantages them. There's not the safety net for daycare. Um, and you, know, you get off track at one of these big companies and you never recover, right? And so we at the embassy, it's interesting, were a beneficiary of this arbitrage, right? Um, where you know we have kind of Western style uh, HR rules. You know, even the U.S., which is not great, maternity leave. It doesn't impact your career, and we were able to attract, even though our salaries had not gone up, right? Our 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 the the amount of attrition we had was so low, right? And so, the, and we were able to attract these really talented women. Um, I think in disproportionate numbers, and it gave us a huge advantage uh, because we couldn't pay that much. And our building was built in the 1960s, it was horrible to work in, right? And uh, I mean, my office was awful, right? And everybody else was even worse. So, you know, um, so we didn't have a lot to give, but we could give Western style management, we could give kind of some of these social benefits that really, I think, helped. So, the, the long and the short of it is not. You know, I've talked to some people, like I, some West, you know, some people who ran, tried to run a bus company. People have had different. The fundamental problem you run into North Korea with these, you know, on any economic activity, in or out of the free, is the rule of law, right? Contracts can't be enforced. There's a lot of corruption, and so a lot of this stuff just collapses. Um, you, you know, some people who, you know, I think there's some extractive industry stuff, coal. It, is of utility, but it's really hard. Everybody will tell you that it's really, really hard to do business in North Korea. I think what the North Koreans are trying to do is experiment, right? But the problem they have is unless they do undertake real, I would say seismic change, or at least in these zones, right? Western style rule of law, all of that, or even something that looks closer to the Chinese model, um, it's just not gonna work, right? So I think if you're asking me my own theory, Kim Jong-un came in, looked at this, recognized he has kind of a problem, has flirted with this, and but recognizes that there are perils whichever direction he goes. So I think what they've done in the intermediate time is consolidate power, build up their program so they've got more to trade on the international side, and then try to get some hard currency coming back into the, the country that will then give them some more maneuver room on how to deal with all this uh, economic decision making. That's my basic guess. One of the main, a big issue that hangs over all of this is that you know, South Koreans, there's a history there of them trying to develop their own program a uh, long time ago. Um, that's point one. Second, some public opinion polls, when you poll about uh, do you want reintroduction of US tactical nuclear weapons, which used to be in Korea a while ago, that poll's pretty high. Um, now, if you ask, quite, if you 
outline the downfalls, the polling data falls off, but it's still high. Um, the Japanese have also carried this enrichment capability for decades that has, they say it's for civilian use, it's cost, it's made no money, um, but it basically gives them the ability to break out. So, you know, your, your point here is a good one, which is if you don't get a handle on the North Korea nuclear program, and there are different uh, theories on how to approach that, you do have a, a potential proliferation race in Northeast Asia, which is incredibly dangerous because all of a sudden you could find yourself with China, Russia, North Korea, South Korea, Japan, and worst case scenario, even maybe Taiwan, unbelievably close proximity, no early warning. The North Koreans don't have any sort of nuclear doctrine from what we can tell that rivals established nuclear weapons powers like Russia, China, the US. It's incredibly dangerous. So it's something that hangs over these talks at every turn. Mm -hmm.